Welcome everyone. I'm Molly Brunson. It is uh, a pleasure to welcome you here for the final installment of Visions of Ecology. This has been a year long series on art and the environment in Eastern Europe and Eurasia. And I'm happy to welcome you here as faculty director of the Russian East European and Eurasian Studies Program here at Yale University who has sponsored this series. Uh, I encourage you, by the way, to join the Reese mailing list. Uh, if you're online joining us, this will be dropped in the chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, please do follow us uh, through our website. Throughout this year, I've been lucky to work with two co-collaborators uh, here at Yale, Yelena Desheva Klein and Barbara Bartumkova, who have helped put this series together. It really, in fact, have put this series together. This is very much their brainchild, and it's been a pleasure to work with them both. Uh, together, we have sought to bring into conversation an international collective of scholars, artists, and curators to consider the intersections of art and ecology. And we hope that this series has been generative in forming new connections and potential collaborations, and really furthering the study of the environment in this region of the world. Uh, we invite you to watch recordings of all previous events, uh, most of which are already up on the Reese website. You can find them there. Uh, so let me introduce our panel today. The title for our panel is Cinema and the Environment in Eastern Europe, and it has been organized both as a celebration of the end of our series, uh, but also, and perhaps more importantly, as a celebration of a significant new publication in the fields of film and ecology. All three speakers today, uh, two in person, one online, uh, will be presenting work from the forthcoming book, Cinema and the Environment in Eastern Europe, From Communism to Capitalism, which has been edited by Lucas Brasiskis and Masha Spolberg. Masha is here today uh, and will be published in October by Bergan Press. Uh, and we have flyers for the book here, so please do be sure to grab one of those before you leave today. Uh, so I'll introduce our speakers today in the order that they themselves will be presenting. Our first presenter will be Barbara Bartunkova. Barbara is a PhD candidate in the history of art at Yale University and the 2022-23 Chesterdale Fellow at the National Gallery of Arts Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts. She specializes in modern and contemporary European art, photography, and film, with a particularly particular focus on interwar and Cold War visual cultures. Her research interests include the intersection of aesthetics and politics, representations of women and gender, and the relationship between art and ecology. Her dissertation is titled Sites of Resistance, Anti-Fascism, and the Czechoslovak Avant-Garde. Our second presenter will be Masha Spolberg, who is an assistant professor of film and electronic arts at Bard College. Her teaching and research explore Russian and East European cinema, eco-cinema, global documentary, and women's cinema. In addition to her work on the book Cinema and the Environment in Eastern Europe, from which our panel has been taken today, she is also co-editor, along with Anastasia Kostina, of Contemporary Russian Documentary, which is under contract with Edinburgh University Press. She holds a PhD in Film and Media Studies and Comparative Literature from Yale University. Our final presenter will be Katie Trumpner, who is Emily Sanford Professor of Comparative Literature and English at Yale, and also on the Film and Media Studies graduate faculty. She works on literature, film, and visual culture in Western and Eastern Europe. She's finishing books on Nazi and Cold War German cinema, and her recent publications include a volume co-edited with Tim Berenger called On the Viewing Platform, The Panorama Between Canvas and Screen. She has also re recently published an article, Stalin Boulevard, Panoramic Vistas and Urban Planning in Eastern European Photo Books, which appeared in the volume Remapping Cold War Media, Institutions, Infrastructures, Networks, Exchanges. So as for our format today, uh, we have a hybrid format, which means we have those of you here in person. We're delighted to see you. We have another contingent online. We're very delighted to have you joining us as well. And so what we'll do is we will move through our presentations through the three panelists. Uh, and at the very end, we will invite questions both from those of you here in the audience and online. So please, if you have a question and you're watching us online, you may drop it into the Q&A or the chat at any time. Uh, we'll collect those as the three panelists speak. Um, and for everybody else, 
jot down your questions and we'll get to them in the discussion period. Uh, one more important announcement, and that is for those of you who are in person, thank you. Our special thank you for being here uh, will be uh, in exchange for a reception after the event. So please do stay and join us for the reception. So once again, thank you all for coming. This is Cinema and the Environment in Eastern Europe. Barbara, go ahead. Thank you so much, Molly, for this wonderful introduction and also to Yelena and uh, Molly for co-organizing this wonderful series. It's been an incredible year and I encourage everyone to follow up on the lectures online. And uh, my special thanks goes to Masha Spolberg and Katie Trumpener for uh, joining us in conversation about um, cin the cinema and the environment. Uh, I will now share my screen um, and share with you course, I hope. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Is this good? Wonderful. So my talk today focuses on the 1966 film, The End of August at the Hotel Ozone, directed by Jan Schmidt and written by Pavel Juracek. The post-apocalyptic film offers a bleak vision of a world devastated by atomic war. It is, however, not concerned with the immediate aftermath of nuclear destruction. Instead, it explores how humans might operate in a radically transformed world as a way of raising existential questions about the nature of who we are as a species and our relationship to the environment. Hotel Ozone follows a group of women as they navigate desolate landscapes and ruined spaces of civilization in search of other survivors. Their older leader is the only one who remembers life on earth before the nuclear apocalypse. However, the younger women born after the disaster are completely detached from history, culture, and societal norms and engage in often violent behavior. The young women mostly follow their elders' orders to find other people, but they are indifferent to the underlying reason for their quest to find male counterparts with whom to preserve human life on Earth. There have been various interpretations of this film to date. Scholars and critics have often read it through the lens of the science fiction genre or seen it as a political allegory. For example, uh, as a commentary on life and intergenerational conflict in socialist Czechoslovakia, or as a metaphor for the Soviet Union's colonial exploitation of Eastern Europe and the destruction of its natural resources and pre-war culture. My analysis of the film instead examines a central but understudied question. How does Hotel Ozone deploy the cinematic media to explore post-apocalyptic ecologies and in particular, the relationship between humanity and the natural environment? I will address this question by conducting a close reading of Hotel Ozone and situating it in relation to other Czechoslovak New Wave films that touch on nuclear themes. Through this analysis, I aim to show how Hotel Ozone offers a deep reflection on environmental conditions in the post-atomic age. Overall, my talk argues that Hotel Ozone uses the anxieties surrounding the Cold War nuclear struggle as a starting point for a deeper investigation of the relationship between human and non-human life, and thus making a vital contribution to 20th century cinema. Based on a short story written by Juracek in 1958, Hotel Ozon was initially conceived as the filmmaker's final project at the State Film School FAMU in Prague. Due to limited resources, the school, however, rejected their proposal. And they finally got the opportunity to make the film after enlisting in the Czechoslovak army, where they worked for its military film unit. The film thus got strikingly made under the auspices of Czechoslovak army film. In the meantime, Juracek had created a different vision of a distant future in his screenplay for the pioneering 1963 science fiction film, Ikarie XB1, directed by Jindřich Polák. And it's worth noting that this film is screening tonight at the Metrograph Cinema in New York, 
So if anyone has time and uh, wants to catch it, you may so after this lecture. In Ikaria Xper 1, an international spaceship crew encounters in 2163 a defunct military spaceship from 1987. Its occupants, associated with Western capitalism, had killed each other. The spaceship holds nuclear warheads and an accidental detonation leads to the death of two exploration team members. This crisis articulates the haunting threat of the atomic age in the 20th century. Another key precedent for Hotel Ozon is the Hall of Lost Footsteps, which was Yaromel Yeresh's graduation project at FAMO in 1960. Yeresh was motivated to create a cinematic response to the nuclear threat after the first successful French atomic bomb test in 1960, which he foregrants in his experimental short film. The film combines everyday scenes at a crowd train station and on a train with expressive dreamlike sequences, as well as documentary footage of the Holocaust, nuclear explosions, and the aftermath of the 1945 atomic bombings of Japan. 20th century violence also appears in Vera Hikilova's 1966 iconic film Daisies, which opens and closes with documentary footage of aerial combat, explosions, and bombarded cities. This framing sets the stage for the playfully disruptive adventures of two young female protagonists who choose to, quote, go bad because everything is going bad in the world, unquote. Daisies offers a compelling counterpoint to Hotel Ozon, in which women also reject social conventions to engage with the world in an experimental way. However, as I will later show, this rejection has much more devastating implications in Schmidt's film. A key sequence, sequence in Yiddish's Hall of Lost Footsteps, which strongly resonates with the opening of Hotel Ozon, juxtaposes a romantic encounter between two lovers, rendered in luminous colors, with black and white footage of a bomber and a close-up of a ticking clock. These shots are accompanied by sound snippets of countdowns delivered by off-screen voices in English, French, and German. Following the countdown, a shot of a nuclear explosion introduces a sequence that interlaces red-tinted shots of the couple, disoriented in a haze of radiation, with black and white clips of the devastating effects of atomic war on cities and human bodies. The countdown sequence resonates with the first moments of Hotel Ozon, which begins with a long shot of an empty hangar's interior as a monotonous male voiceover counts down from 10 in English before the image fades to white. Next, a field of wheat swaying in the wind is shown as another disembodied male voice declares the countdown in Russian, followed by another wait out, fade out to white. The use of English and Russian here of course, highlights the tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, situating the film's imagined future in a post-World War II context. This dualistic opposition is, however, soon complicated by the subsequent, subsequent shots. A countdown in Chinese accompanies a close-up of reading glasses on an open book. The English voice reappears and overlaps disjointedly with the Chinese countdown before another fade out to white. The next shot depicts a richly decorated space of a church. Here, two French and Russian voices alternate in counting down from 10 to one, creating a syncopated rhythm, following another fade into white. The sequence ends in a multilingual chorus of overlapping voices, accompanying a view of a tuft of grass set against a rock formation, before fading into white again. The soundscape of multiple interweaving languages suggests humanity's shared complicity in the nuclear arms race and instills a sense of collective responsibility for environmental destruction. In contrast to Yeresh and Hikilova, Schmidt avoids using charged visual tropes, such as the mushroom cloud or explicit depictions of industrial warfare and mass suffering. Instead, Hotel Ozone stages the world's destruction more abstractly as a series of erasures. Each opening shot performs an effacement by fading into white, 
erasing different aspects of human civilization, including modern technology, agriculture, literature, and religion. Ultimately, the natural environment is also effaced. The final shot of Hotel Ozone's opening sequence symbolically stages the ultimate disappearance of the human trace on Earth as a wet footprint on a stone ground gradually fades before our eyes. When considered in the context of atomic warfare, the dark evaporating footprint evokes the haunting nuclear shadows in the aftermath of the US atomic bombings of Japan. It also highlights the power of the atomic bomb to obliterate humankind and other life forms on Earth. Here we are reminded again of the Hall of Lost Footsteps, which opens with a series of telegraphic paper strips marking the pivotal events of the atomic age. The first of them reads, Hiroshima, human footprints were found in the burned concrete. While Yiddish's film is concerned with the lethal effects of nuclear experimentation and war, Schmidt brings into relief the significant impact of humankind on the environment by juxtaposing the fading footprint with geological strata, contrasting the ephemeral trace of human existence with the deep time of planetary history. A large fissure widens to reveal a dark abyss as the image fades into a tracking shot closely charting the surface of a geological terrain onto which the film's opening credits are superimposed. As Jennifer Fay has remarked in her analysis of nuclear test films, cinema became a way to record and naturalize the nuclear condition that leaves clear signals of human-caused planetary change in the geological record. The visual motif of the human imprint also brings to mind the media theorist Lethmanovich's claim that cinema is the art of the index. It is an attempt to make art out of a footprint. This statement highlights the cinematic medium's unique relation to reality due to the photochemical basis of the film image. The opening sequence of Hotel Ozone indeed subtly returns toward the medium of film itself, with the countdown evoking the head leader of a film reel and the fade out into white laying bare the reflective surface of the projection screen. These self-reflexive gestures can be read as an attempt to highlight the potential of the cinematic medium as a substrate onto which the relationship between living beings and the environment, presence and absence, past and future, can be screened. In Hotel Ozone, the natural environment also provides a different kind of screen that adopts different valences, from refracting the women's experiences to acting as barriers to their subjectivity. After the credit sequence, the film focuses on a cross section of a felled tree. An older woman's hand enters the frame with her index finger lightly touching the tree trunk's surface. As the woman narrates significant events since the nuclear catastrophe, her index finger highlights the tree rings as markers of temporality. Her disembodied voice addresses a yet to be seen you, placing the viewer in the position of the young women who are only now learning about the effects of the nuclear disaster and their journey. This shot thus represents the woman's mental landscape while mediating personal and collective history. The cinematic trope of a tree section as a means of exploring the constructed nature of identity and memory famously also appeared in Alfred Hitchcock's 1958 film Vertigo and Chris Marker's 1962 short film La Jeté. In Vertigo and Hotel Ozone, Touch mediates narratives about the characters' presumed lives and demarcates the limits of life and death. In Hotel Ozone, the nuclear disaster is not depicted as a single traumatic event, but rather as a prolonged process of death and loss. In the elders' account, many survived. Quote, there were enough of us, people, animals, and trees. Only later did everything start to die off, people, animals, and trees, unquote. Her insistence on shared experience is however undermined throughout the film, which refuses to offer a redemptive vision of harmonious interspecies relations in a world freed from the destructive nature of modern civilization. The shot of the tree cross section is perhaps the most powerful visual metaphor for the film's staging of the relationship between the female protagonists and the natural environment, as it em emphasizes haptic engagement as a model for making sense of the world and exploring the possibilities and limits of knowledge. 
when the older woman discovers a series of white abstract marks on ruined buildings in an abandoned town, she follows and touches the markings, her fingers dusted in chalk powder. These traces turn from abstract shapes to a promising human-shaped human stick figure. The leader becomes animated with hope that this seeming evidence of other human life will lead them closer to an encounter. Ultimately, however, she learns that one of her group members has chalk hidden in her trousers. Hotel Ozon present, presents the viewer with a series of unprecedented models for the relationship between humans and their environment. Throughout the film, the young women explore their surroundings experimentally, testing the limits of their agency. Yet this radical and potentially liberating attitude is often portrayed as destructive. The natural environment remains as a site of human exploitation and reckless behavior. For example, when the group finds a gasoline canister, they let the flammable liquid spill into the grass. Then one of the women mischievously lights it on fire. And another one throws live ammunition into it, causing an explosion and a blaze that scares their horses. As the women encounter different beings, they do not hesitate to commit meaningless and cruel killings. They twist off the head of a snake, slay a stray dog with a firearm, shoot and disembowel a cow, catch fish with grenades and cut their heads off, and finally kill the only human being they encounter. The brutal display of animal killing is perhaps the most disturbing aspect of Hotel Ozon. Schmidt deployed this tactic to shock audiences without acknowledging the problematic nature of committing violence against non-human animals in his cinematic attempt to address the crisis of social relations in the face of environmental de devastation. The film is mostly emotionally di distanced from its characters, conveying a matter of fact representation of the group's nomadic journey and alienation by means of cinematic naturalism. This approach contrasts remarkably with a later Czechoslovak New Wave film that thematizes the cyclical nature of human violence, Juraj Jakubisko's 1968 trilogy, The Deserters and the Nomads. Following narratives set during both world wars, the film imagines the aftermath of a global nuclear disaster. The figure of death and a young nurse escape an underground shelter and seek in vain to find human survivors ac across plains of cracked earth and lush landscapes. Jakubisko's cinematic approach draws on folk culture, bold colors, and at times hallucinatory cinematography. This dizzying film envisions a world where even death's life loses meaning as she has no more people to kill. Ultimately, she perishes on a green field amid a dramatic and absurd aerial bombing. The grotesque nature and intense visual stylization of Jakubisko's post-apocalyptic universe stands in stark contrast with the pared down black and white aesthetic of Hotel Ozon and its sense of detachment. The film, however, provides a few rare glimpses into the older woman's subjective experience. In these instances, the environment is activated through point of view shots, such as when she contemplates the frescoes on the ornate ceiling of a dilapidated Baroque church. In another sequence, her childhood memories are mobilized by a seemingly familiar landscape as the point of view shot charts the trees and the glimmering river in a valley deep below. Yet for her young followers, the river is merely another obstacle to be overcome. After crossing the river, the women finally encounter another human being, an older man inhabiting the derelict Hotel Ozone at the bottom of the valley. The hotel's interior reflects the man's precious attachment to relics of civilization, such as the last newspaper published before the nuclear apocalypse, an old television, a chess set, and a gramophone with a single record. His overly polite manners appear humorous in the face of the women's experience of nomadic survival, especially when he proudly opens a parasol on the hotel, hotel's patio to serve the women milk, a product of animal domestication they are unfamiliar with. This scene opposes two distinct conceptions of human life in the aftermath of the apocalypse. Here, the filmmakers diverge from their naturalism in a bird's eye view shot of the parasol that entirely conceals the characters underneath. The stripes of the sunshade evoke the opening cross section of the tree. Yet it acts as a radically different kind of screen, 
that emphasizes the separation between the viewer and the subjects of cinematic fiction. Exhausted by the journey and realizing that the older man cannot fulfill their hopes of conceiving children, the older woman falls ill. As she lies in bed, blankly staring at the ceiling, she reflects on humanity's presence on the planet. Quote, tins are falling apart and cartridges are rusting. Nothing grows, the earth loathes us, unquote. The old man attempts to counter her pessimistic vision by arguing that she will be the immortal founder of a new civilization. Yet she insists, we are like vermin and the earth loathes us. Soon after, the woman dies. It is then this deeper realization of humanity's complicity in environmental destruction that appears to contribute to her death. Her burial, again, brings to mind the film's opening through a series of close-ups of the women's hands with dirt behind their fingernails. The camera's proximity convey, conveys a rare moment of intimacy and introspection. The camera finally rests on the clasped hands of the old man before slowly tracking upward to reveal his face as he silently utters, I will plant something here, maybe a juniper. The man's promise to plant a tree suggests a continuation of life the woman's decaying body providing nutrients to other organisms within the ecosystem, effacing the boundary between the body and the environment, figure, and ground. Unlike other beings killed in the film, the woman's death is memorialized on a meadow atop a hill, which bears two other graves with wooden crosses. Thus, human mourning and remembrance rituals are embedded within the natural landscape, which is emphasized by the sound of the wailing wind taking over as the group slowly walks away. Yet this elegiac representation of death as part of the cycle of life is followed by a much more cynical ending. As the young women shoot the man after he refuses to give them his gramophone, the only artifact of a lost civilization that has sparked their interest. In Hotel, Oz in Hotel Ozone's concluding part, the finitude of human life is thus laid bare in its pathos and absurdity. The film thus goes beyond its matter-of-fact exploration of conditions of survival and introduces a critical perspective. The final shot of the film reveals an expansive, flattened view of a tree-lined mountainside, its horizon traversed by miniature figures that move off screen. Their presence is overshadowed by the vastness of the mountain and the intense howling of the wind. As we have seen, Hotel Ozone is mainly preoccupied with the issue of humanity's survival, yet the film's conclusion crucially suggests a decentering of human subjectivity. The film thus offers a speculative vision of what fate humanity can have in a post-apocalyptic world, raising key questions about the role of humans within their broader ecologies. Thank you very much. I'll just transition. Thank you, Barbara. Um, that was lovely. I, I think that close reading is going to serve us well because for what I've prepared for us, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly um, about both kind of the aims of the volume. I know that this is the last event in the series, right? Barbara, the, yeah, okay. So um, I'll start first just by saying a big thank you to Molly um, and Barbara and Elena for this wonderful series that you've put together. I've been attending all of the talks, um, as many as I've been able to online, and I have to say they've set the bar pretty high. Um, so as Molly mentioned, the idea for this particular panel grew out of the edited volume that Barbara, Katie, and I are all contributing to. And so I thought I would just throw, we have the flyers down here, but I wanted to throw the table of contents up on the slide. I think there is one issue that I need a few permissions to request oh. here, please. Hold on, we've got a little technical so. issue. Let me make you an editor. to connect to the internet.
Sorry, Yale guest isn't working, so I'm trying to see if I can get on Yale wireless. Yes, thank you. I mean, I should be able to get on Yale wireless, so then. Um, yeah, do we want to let Katie jump ahead and I'll try to connect? No, she's not on. Would you like me to go? Yeah, Katie, if you don't mind, if you feel ready, no, then no I can problem. try to connect to the internet while you, yes, while you go next. No, no problem at all. Thank okay. you. So let me just uh, get my PowerPoint up. All right. Well, that was indeed lovely, Barbara. Um, I'm going to do something very different. I'm going to talk uh, more uh, extemporaneously. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? Hi, everybody. Is that working? Yes. Do you want to go into presenter mode, Katie? What's that? Do you want to go into presenter mode? Yes, I do. Uh, let me just start the slide. OK. How's that? Perfect. Yeah. OK, very good. Um, so I'm going to talk more off the cuff uh, if i have if i begin to exceed my 15 minutes please uh let me know and i will quickly bring things to an end um so i wanted to talk uh give a kind of overview of the um environmentalist movement in east germany and what kinds of films were made uh under with government support despite the government um guerrilla films and illicit films and then what kind of films were made in the immediate aftermath of 89 and i guess um my first slide um brings back a lot of memories for me because i had just moved to west berlin in 1987 in the fall of 1987 um when 20 stasi agents forcibly dismantled the fledgling eco library run by one of the East Berlin churches, which had been set up the year before, uh, arresting seven on charges of distributing a treasonous publication, which was this little mimeographed eco newspaper, um, eco newsletter. And that was a shocking event uh, for many of us, widely publicized and actually kind of announced to the world there was a new independent East German eco movement that hadn't really existed before, Oh, now I'm having trouble getting my um, my slide to go forward. I wonder why that is. There we go. Um, so, um, in fact, um, just to give a very brief, the briefest of backgrounds, um, East Germany, like other parts of communist Eastern Europe, under Stalinism, had fostered a productivist sensibility. And the emphasis was on rebuilding from the ruins of war and ensuring economic prosperity for its citizens. The ecological was thought about uh, from time to time, but the cost of that rebuilding tended to be minimized and overlooked pretty consistently until 89. Um, East Germany did have official watchdog organizations, but again and again, they were persuaded to overlook environmental damage to raise the country's standard of living. And um, this is, I think, especially ironic in 1980, the government became worried by the success in West Germany of the newly founded Green Party. And so they decided that they um, would found their own affirmative ecological group, the Society for Nature and the Environment, which was intended to focus on nature while ignoring the obvious ecological crises going on in East Germany. And it was the organization was designed to uh, contain and deflect um, ecological energies among its own citizens. And even though there were many Stasi agents planted in the group, they worried constantly about church influence. And um, so it's it was sort of a minor miracle that a, an, a truly independent ecological group emerged under church sponsorship um, in the late 80s. And despite the seizure of the ecological library, there was a regrouping the following year 
a new ecological coalition um, across East Germany called the New Ark. And they had a publication, uh, which is, and three of the issues are gonna set the agenda for the rest of what I talk about. On the one hand, they had an issue about forest death. And I'm gonna be construing that fairly broadly. Um, so the problems that they pointed to were the chemical industry, toxic pollutants, and indeed forest death all over East Germany and uh, going into neighboring Bohemia. Uh, secondly, was atomic energy after Chernobyl, and as as you're gonna as we're gonna see, the question of atomic energy was skewed in an interesting direction in East Germany because they housed one of the largest uranium mines in Europe, which was um, initially started in the 40s as a kind of secret Soviet army occupied place to produce uranium for the Soviet nuclear program. So atomic energy in both senses of the word, raw materials as well as nuclear power. And third, and most surprisingly perhaps, and I think this is a very distinctive emphasis of the East German movement, was the issue on our inner cities are collapsing. And as we're gonna see, the question of the demolition and raising of villages of historic buildings is gonna be seen as part and parcel of what the ecology movement should think about. And I think this is rather unusual. I don't know of other ecological movements that had this as one of their pillars. Um, so for most of this, we're going to be talking mainly about two eco trouble spots. On the bottom of the map, this is north and south of Leipzig uh, in the south of um, East Germany. So this moot at the very bottom of the screen is this um, enormous mine. It was the it was the world's fourth biggest uranium mine, which um, produced um, uh, 230,000 and 400 tons of uranium, enough to build, I think, hundreds of um, uranium bombs. And um, this, as we'll see, led to lingering radioactivity and the destruction of numerous medieval villages when the mines expanded or because of radiation. Um, and to the north is a different kind of trouble spot, uh, Bitterfeld, uh, very appropriately named. The name in German means bitter field. This was the epicenter of the East German chemical industry belt and the producer of much of the acid rain, which killed the forests. Okay, so let's start with um, pollution and acid rain. Um, so this is probably the most famous um, East German film about ecological issues. It was a guerrilla film. It was secretly made by people from the Green Network ARC. Um, it was made with the help of a West Berlin cameraman and one or two other West Berliners who snuck into East Germany. Um, they picked a day when the Lutheran Church was having its annual conference, so they knew a lot of the Stasi would be there um, sort of surveying the goings on of the church, which was tolerated but always um, under deep suspicion by the government. It was also um, the day of the um, one of the big uh, soccer championships, so they thought whichever Stasi people were not at the Lutheran thing would be home watching television, so they snuck into um, the mining area, the, the, the chemical area around Bitterfeld, and they just took candid pictures uh, with the help of a local ecologist who was there. And the pictures are pretty shocking. They managed to develop the film, smuggle it to West Germany. It was shown on West German and international television, and it was also watched internally inside the um, East German eco movement and the East German Protestant church. And the Stasi were bitter and tried in vain to figure out who had made the film. If people had been caught, they would most likely have faced long jail sentences, especially since this involved East-West ecological collaboration and would thus have been labeled treasonous, almost certainly, and led to long prison sentences. So, um, so this is... Uh, you can see already from the smoke that's coming out, the smoke is in a natural and strange color and clearly has chemicals in it. In addition, they found, um, this was apparently the color of the sky. 
and they found these many, many barrels with seeping toxic and radioactive, radioactive chemicals, which were running into the soil, um, creating huge, weird, blistery morphings and running directly into uh, local rivers and into the water table near various high rise settlements. So clearly this was an eco catastrophe waiting to happen and already happening. Um, with the money that um, they did surreptitiously get some money from some of the television companies that showed their film footage. And with this, they bought their own video camera. They tried to make a further film, but there were Stasi plants in the group who managed to um, make sure that most of the film was spoiled. Um, there was another attempt at the same time uh, throughout the 80s by a documentarian named Gunter Lippmann to make his own film about, um, which was supposed to be called Who Has Destroyed You Beautiful Forest, about forest death. And um, he made eight attempts to submit footage and every time it was turned back. And um, the studio verdict was too many dead trees, too little optimism. And another commentator said, the people who live here already know about it and no one else needs to know. So it was only after 89 that he was able to release this and it had the telling subtitle, uh, how a film was prevented. And so it includes the story of the banning of the various footage. Uh, and there were other films that came out right after on or after 89, which had also been kind of slowly in the making, but weren't officially approved, including this film about the Lausitz region and its devastation by overmining chemicals, etc. Let's go on to the tricky question of energy radiation and Vismut, which is the big Soviet mine. Um, Vismut is the German word for bismut, um, the, the radioactive element. And um, this is the major film made about it. I think this subject was so taboo that it was really not possible to even try to make anything about it until after 89, because um, this was a Soviet controlled um, a Soviet controlled area controlled largely by the Soviet army for the benefit of the Soviets. And that was a very delicate relationship, which really was never talked about openly. Um, so between a million, uh, between half a million and a million workers worked here between 1949 when the mine was set up and 1989. Uh, Fulker Cup has absolutely horrifying statistics which have been secret until 89. So I'm just gonna read a few of them aloud. So from, so in a six month period in 1949 alone, over a thousand workers were killed in on the job accidents. Um, Almost 3,500 3, additional workers required amputations. Over 16,000 suffered very severe health damage. Um, over 11,000 forced workers escaped. Uh, over 200 crippled themselves to avoid further labor. And over 500 workers found guilty of sabotage were sentenced by Soviet tribunals to long labor terms. So basically this was run in the first place. It was manned primarily by forced laborers and former prisoners. And one um, Anglo-American journalistic expose in 1949 claimed that it was part of an international gulag, what the names Buchenwald and Belzen were to the anti-Nazis of Europe five years ago. Um, most of the people he interviews in the film are part of a later wave of workers, many of whom are displaced people who or um, uh, Germans from the Eastern territories who came as refugees after the war and were forced to make a new beginning and came to Vismut in order to try to make a fortune. Uh, it was high paying because the work was so was so dangerous. Um, and he, the film largely consists of interviews with the surviving workers, which touch on things like their very high incidence of cancer, a lot of workers who died even under the slightly improved safety conditions, and their children's birth defects. Um, there had been several attempts to uh, de depict the frontier society, Soviet soldiers, uh, 
prostitutes and other prisoners uh, shipped there, forced laborers of various kinds. One of them, this extremely interesting film, was made in 58, but not released due to Soviet pressures and was only released in 72, very much worth watching. And there was also a very ambitious novel, which was criticized heft heftily in 1965. And the writer ended up abandoning the novel and dying of alcoholism. It was published uh, belatedly only in 2007 and is now also available in English translation. Uh, what was released at the only film about nuclear anything in East Germany is this very Cold War film from 1959, White Blood, which blames uh, the Americans for causing radiation poisoning and uh, blasts their nuclear program. And of course, the film makes absolutely no mention of the fact that East Germany was itself a major uranium producer. So back to the film from 93. So this is a very hard hitting um, piece of investigative journalism which talks a lot to survivors and tries to understand kind of what they went through. At the beginning and the end of the film, there is an attempt to show radioactivity. So they have um, Geiger counters, which they are showing close up at the beginning of the film. And at the end of the film, they have somebody with a Geiger counter going around in the villages nearby. And because the um, all of the concrete used in local building from 49 onward tended to be made of local stone. Even the pavement in these um, villages is still radioactive. Okay, that brings us to the third and final topic, which is architectural ecology. And this too has several interesting faces. So one of the big um, kind of refrains in a few brave and highly censored films before 89 and in a series of films after 89 is the question of what was raised. Um, in the 80s, they were still raising villages to expand the face of coal mines and thus to extract a few more years of coal supplies. And the fact they were, some of the villages were medieval villages was irrelevant. Um, some villages, a, a series of villages in the 50s and 60s were torn down because of the uranium mines. The mines were swallowing them, they were destabilizing them, or the, the villages had become radioactive, so they had to be raised. And again, these were medieval villages. There was also a lot of critique, and this is to be found throughout um, East German feature films, in daring films that were controversial, almost banned, but not quite banned, about the erasure of older neighborhoods and other inner cities. And the justification was on the one hand to erase the memory of Wilhelmine society and class society and class struggle and to modernize housing and to concentrate workers in high rises, both in the inner city and in, and in satellite cities. Um, and then finally, there's a very interesting film by the same person in 83, he made this highly ambivalent film about the raising of a village for mining. And in 93, he made a much more forensic film about the raising of a famous Baroque church, which the Nazis had used. Um, it was raised in 68 to build the Potsdam Computer Center. And he does a kind of forensic analysis and goes back and grills people as to how they came to make the decision, why the decision was, was um, a foregone one, and so on. Okay, so these are some of the films that talk about the demolition of rather beautiful older buildings in the inner city and the building of um, high-rise prefab satellite cities, which are rather soulless in their general gestalt, and which in the post-89 period, many of them became hotbeds of neo-fascism. Um, one question that I'd like to just put out there, there was a lot of criticism in the late 80s under Ceausescu, Romania had a systemization program, which involved raising the historic core of Bucharest to build grand boulevards, modeled partly on Phnom Penh, and the raising of many medieval villages, especially ethnically Hungarian and German villages, with the population transferred en masse 
to um, new high rise agro industrial centers. And there was a plan, he then planned to raise half of Romania's villages by 2000. There were sustained protests from Hungary and from West Germany and actually worldwide. And I guess the question that I come to belatedly is to what extent were these smaller scale East German village raisings comparable if less systematic? Were they problematic in the same kind of obvious way that to outsiders, the Romanian systemization looked? So here is a, a beautiful ambivalent kind of guarded film made in 83, officially released in with a limited release of um, a mourning for a village which was about to be destroyed and then was destroyed to produce two extra years of coal. And uh, in what I think of as the most moving moment in this film, we see this woman holding up a picture, a historic picture of this older inn, which has been there for 200 years. We pan out and we see her standing there and we see how dilapidated the inn has become. And then we pan up further. I don't have a still of this, I'm sorry, but we pan up and we see workers on the roof already dismantling the building. So she's standing there with this photograph as a kind of guarantor there, I have the historical record, this was here, it won't be here, but I'll have the picture. And I think that's especially interesting. Uh, then the same director, 10 years later, made this interesting film, forensic film about the destruction of the Garnison Church in Potsdam. Um, but there's another film which was made in 2006, so long after this first wave of films, by some directors who are very interested in uranium and its after effects. And they went back and made a film about the lost villages of Vismuth. So all of these villages, which were raised in the 50s and 60s um, because of the mine, of the uranium mines in various ways. And um, what is most striking to me is how much they focus in on the civil courage of some of the local um, teenagers at the time, who several of whom took surreptitiously took pictures to document the, their, their villages both before and during the demolition process. And in many cases, um, they were threatened. In one case, their film was pulled out of the camera by the Soviet soldiers who were there, but some of the pictures survived. They hid the pictures for 40 years. And then after 89, that this is the documentation. And um, there's also, in addition, a woman who grew up in the village, was devastated by, as everybody in the village was, by its destruction. And years later, set about trying to make a chronicle of what the village was so that her children could understand something about where she came from, even though there is nothing left to look at. Um, and I think, well, I guess one of the things that really moves me about this is, in my view, um, after 89, documentarians had a new kind of freedom to, to um, release previously secret documents, to, uh, to um, produce an interplay between images and statistics. Um, but above all, they gave homage to the to their forerunners, these lay teenagers who were just furious about what was happening. And even though their scope of action was very limited, they nonetheless did brave things to try to document what was happening. And to me, it seems as if they are pointing back to these people as their own forebearers. And they are trying to establish a kind of longer lineage of civil courage in the face of, you know, a very powerful and at, at times frightening government to try to tell the truth about what was happening ecologically. So I'll stop there, but I hope at least that's piqued your interest in what was going on in East Germany. So thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. And we had originally, I'm, I'm guessing that we had originally structured our talks to follow a chronological format. Um, but I think I'm actually going to dwell kind of in the second part of my talk on that period of the late 1980s. 
So I think there'll be some nice overlap. Um, and Katie, thank you for taking us like through such a transhistorical moment in the talk. Um, so in what I would like to do today, I kind of have a, two parts to my talk. The first part is that as one of the co-editors, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, overall about what our aims were in the volume. And I think they intersect with the series that um, Barbara and Molly and Elena have organized. And then in the second half, I'll talk more about Chernobyl and the ways in which Chernobyl both challenged and really crafted or created um, very belatedly a Soviet nuclear imaginary. Um, so here, once again, is the flyer for the volume. You see the table of contents on screen. And so the central question of the volume, and I think of the series that you have organized also, is why Eastern Europe, right? Um, we have a small, a mighty but small audience here today. Um, so I think that that speaks kind of to this question, right? Like what is specific about Eastern Europe? Why is it worth looking at Eastern Europe from an eco-critical point of view? Um, and I wanna share with you some of the answers that my co-editor Lucas and I came up with in trying to draft the introduction. Um, so the first answer that we gave is that uh, the relationship between humans, animals and nature is just so at the forefront of so much of Eastern European cinema. Um, and I joke with my students that I have a very troubled relationship with Tarkovsky. I often say, love the art, hate the man. Um, but for better or worse, he's become a metonym for so much of Eastern European cinema. And so up here, I have a still from his film, Nostalgia, and next to him, um, there's a still from Bellatar's Damnation. So when I was a graduate student here, Katie Trumpener was my PhD advisor. Um, and something that I'm infinitely grateful to Katie for is that she affirmed me in my desire to champion small cinemas meaning both small national cinemas and small cinemas in the sense of cinemas that didn't fit this feature length, you know, um, auteur driven art cinema type of filmmaking. Um, and so with Lucas, when we set about doing the volume, we wanted to acknowledge that yes, there's a lot of nature in the most canonical films, um, but there's also a sense in which people like Tarkovsky have eclipsed a lot of other forms and kinds of filmmaking. And so one of our main aims in the volume was to try to move away from both a Russo-centric, Lucas is from Lithuania, I'm from Ukraine, to move away from a very Russo-centric canon um, to consider the cinemas of the countries that were annexed to the Soviet Union in the wake of World War II, but also to consider other forms of filmmaking beyond the kinds of films that were made for the art cinema circuit. Um, and one of our really big hopes, specifically with adopting an eco-critical lens, is that focusing on the land, on something kind of that physical and material, would really emphasize local histories and local legacies of resistance to the uniform, the kind of the uniform homogenizing, modernizing yet homogenizing force um, of the Soviet project. Um, and one of the things that we would talk quite a bit about um, in working on the volume was how the very term Soviet bloc invokes a kind of totality, right? This, it, it invokes this image of something completely total with no variation within it. And so our aim was really to think about the variation that there was all across the lands that were shaped um, by this project. And I think that the very fact that in this panel, our papers today speak to cinema produced in Czechoslovakia, in Ukraine, and in East Germany um, is really significant in and of itself um, and worthwhile. So the second answer to the question of why Eastern Europe um, has to do with how trends evolve in academia. Um, we realized we did this deep plunge into the literature um, on eco-criticism, uh, and we realized that there was a, a really interesting conundrum in the temporality and the chronology of how books came out. So although eco-criticism is rooted in the environmentalism of the 1970s, it really coalesced as a movement within literary studies in the 1990s. Um, and as scholar Ursula Heise and others have demonstrated, it concerned itself first with romantic poetry, that was kind of the first object people looked at, um, and then North American nature writing, people like Emerson, Thoreau, et cetera. Um, and this happened at the same time that there was also a consolidation of post-colonial studies. And so what happened with eco-criticism is that it kind of jumped from paying attention to objects from the first world, um, which I just mentioned, um, to increasingly paying attention to what was going on in the former third world. Um, and in the literature of the global South. And all of this makes a lot of sense, right? As scholars, um, and I think popular culture have been recognizing increasingly more and more, right? It's the countries of the first world that created the trouble. It's the countries of the former third world that are paying the price for it. Um, what Lucas and I realized in putting together our volume was that this completely eclipsed or overlooked the former second world. Um, and that strange thing about temporality is that all of this is happening in academia in the early 1990s, right after the Soviet Union has collapsed. And so because the collapse of the Soviet Union happens at that time, there's a lot of attention to it on the part of anthropologists, people working in political science, sociologists, but nobody's really thinking about 
kind of the cultural products of the former Soviet Union um, in terms of this eco-critical gaze. It's completely eclipsed kind of by this first third world connection. And so what we thought is that in a way, we were kind of jumping on a bandwagon. Um, since the 2000s, there has been a series of books coming out about various kinds of eco cinemas, books on excellent books on Chinese eco cinema, Italian eco cinema. And so we were coming out with one more book <laughs> about another area studies eco cinema. But we really deeply and truly thought that Eastern Europe has something very special to offer, um, precisely because it complicates a, lo a lot of the facile, I think, ideas and concepts um, that have been played around with um, in eco-criticism. Uh, and so, uh, oh, I also wrote down in my notes that um, when it comes to Eastern Europe, the kind of scholarship that has been done since the collapse of the Soviet Union has mostly focused on individual figures. So there has been scholarship on the landscape, you know, of Isaac Levitan, um, on the exceptional nature writing in Leo Tolstoy, in Turgenev, in Mikhail Prishlin. Um, there's so much of it there. But almost all of the studies have been about individual figures, and there hasn't really been an attempt to systematize it or to think about these things um, and these texts in relation to one another. And so our hope was that the volume would take this kind of first step to creating a more systematic study. Um, and then the third and final reason is that uh, one of the central debates in all of the scholarship, you know, on eco anything, is this question of the Anthropocene as a term. Um, and there's been a big debate between whether or not we should call it the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene. Um, and the argument goes that when you call it the Anthropocene, you're kind of blaming all of humanity for the problem that we find ourselves in, whereas it's actually the countries of the first world that caused all the trouble. And so the proponents of Capitalocene think that it's a much more specific term because it singles out the responsibility of the global north. Um, and Lucas and I really thought that looking and attending to what was happening in the former communist countries complicates this, right? by demonstrating that even communist countries can take a, an approach to nature that is just as extractive and just as exploitative um, as the countries of the so-called global north nowadays. Um, so those were like the three structural kind of things that we were thinking about in putting together the book. Um, and I hope they resonate with some of the talks um, that we've been hearing so far. And so without further ado, I'm going to talk to turn to Chernobyl in my paper. And Chernobyl really is this moment of the undoing um, of the Soviet Union. And I think a really key turning point um, in the way that nature is conceived in the region. So oh, here's the, the title of my talk is Chernobyl and the Crafting of a Soviet Nuclear Imaginary. So as facetious as it sounds, Chernobyl has been having a moment. Um, the success of Serhii Plohi's riveting 2018 book, I, I sat down thinking that I would start reading it and I read it <laughs> cover to cover, um, and Craig Mason's 2019 miniseries got both scholars and the broader public interested in the disaster and its legacy. The disaster actually took place on April 26, 1986. And so I think I find it deeply meaningful. Barbara pointed this out to me yesterday, actually, thank you, that we are we're talking about this exactly on the 37th anniversary of the disaster. Um, and our editors actually at Berghahn very thoughtfully pointed this out um, by highlighting all of the books that they've been publishing related to Chernobyl and its legacy. Uh, so I'll add also that one of the reasons that I personally am so interested in Chernobyl is that I was born in 1988 in Ukraine, two years after um, the disaster happened. Fortunately, in Odessa, which was out of the way of the cloud. Um, but I've been thinking about my own lifespan as the measure of distance we have chronologically to Chernobyl, right? Like I am as old as, as the disaster to some extent. Um, and I think that there's many things that Chernobyl can teach us. The one that I would like to focus on here is what it has to tell us about nuclear imaginaries on either side of the Cold War divide. So uh, in her study of the way that Chernobyl has been represented in Russian, um, Belarusian and Ukrainian fiction film, Olha Bruchavetska, um, a film scholar following Bart, calls the disaster, quote unquote, a master signifier or a key symbol. If Hiroshima and Nagasaki marked the start of the Cold War, she argues, Chernobyl came to mark its end. Um, and in her article, she has an article about the fiction films representing Chernobyl. Bruchavetska demonstrates the ways in which these narrative films work to nationalize what was at first perceived to be a global disaster, transforming Chernobyl into the founding trauma of the new Ukrainian and Belarusian nations. More recently, historian Serhii Plohi also compellingly argues that in exposing the Soviet regime of lies and secrecy, um, Chernobyl essentially set off a chain of events that led to the demise of the Soviet Union. And here are just some photos of the many protests that took place across Ukraine and Belarus, um, kind of associating the, the trauma of Chernobyl with a desire increasingly for national self-determination. 
So the violence wrought by Chernobyl appears in retrospect as much conceptual as physical in nature. For those who were living in its vicinity, Chernobyl had very concrete, devastating physical effects that would last their entire lives and well beyond. For everyone else at a greater remove in the Soviet Union, once the state finally acknowledged the event, it also marked a point of radical rupture, calling into question the political and philosophical frameworks that had structured people's lives. One cannot help but wonder if the shock value of the event also had to do with the fact that the Soviet Union was not just politically or technologically ill-equipped to face the disaster, but also intellectually ill-equipped. Um, as early as 1965, in a piece titled The Imagination of Disaster, Susan Sontag, uh, no less, argued that cinema played an important role in normalizing what is psychologically unbearable, namely the mid 20th century realization that quote, collective incineration and extinction could come at any time virtually without warning. Sontag herself found all of these American disaster films very unconvincing and uninteresting. Um, and she actually wrote, quote, they inculcate a strange apathy concerning the processes of radiation, contamination and destruction that I for one find haunting and depressing. Nevertheless, she believed that these films both distracted people and helped to normalize um, or neutralize the unbearable. And what I find absolutely fascinating, what I argue in my piece, is that unlike the US, the Soviet Union lacked a nuclear imaginary. Um, anthropologist Nancy Reese was one of the first to point out that, quote, there really was no Russian Cold War culture. And indeed, the kind of consciousness of the nuclear arms race that from 1945 on inspired Western war fantasies and peace movements and their thousands of cultural productions had hardly taken place in Russia. Or as historian Miriam Dobson would somewhat more colorfully put it, there was no Soviet equivalent of on the beach, no Russian Bill Haley hoping he would be the only man left with 13 women when the H-bomb went off. Before the Gorbachev era, few Soviet writers and film directors portrayed human civilization on the brink of self-destruction or tried to conjure up a post-apocalyptic world. Imagining the destructive power of atomic weapons was antithetical to the forward-looking spirit of the communist project. And she goes on actually to cite Vyacheslav Molotov, Stalin's right-hand man, saying, how can it be asserted that civilization could perish in an atomic war? Then why should we build socialism? <laughs> why worry about tomorrow? It would be better to supply everyone with coffins now. Of course, the imaginary of nuclear war differs substantially from that of a nuclear or atomic accident. Yet the imbalance is striking. While one can count dozens of American post-apocalyptic uh, films, Soviet examples are few and far between. The 1962 Thaw-era classic, Nine Days in One Year, shows a scientist willingly exposing himself to a lethal dose of radiation for the sake of Soviet science and progress. But it avoids any explicit imagery. We don't see any kind of radiation illness and it focuses instead on the character's relationships. Tarkovsky's Stalker, released in 1979, um, was retroactively said to have foreseen the exclusion zone um, and was in part inspired by rumors of an earlier atomic accident, Chernobyl wasn't actually the first one, at the Mayak plant uh, outside of Chelyabinsk in the late 1950s, in 1957. And Konstantin Lapushansky's Dead Man's Letters, which is the only film to explicitly depict a post-apocalyptic landscape that was caused by nuclear war, by the fallout of nuclear war, was actually in production at the time of the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. So in this regard, what's really interesting when we look beyond the Soviet Union to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, as Barbara's talk so wonderfully demonstrated, um, is that those countries, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, to a certain extent had a greater freedom when it came to certain things. Um, and so as Barbara's paper has shown, there was quite a bit of interest um, in imagining right, post-apocalyptic realities on the part of Czech and Slovak filmmakers, even if those filmmakers struggled to make or exhibit those films. Of the films that were made, I've tried to kind of uh, group them a little bit and think about what features they share. What we get, especially in the early 1960s, are quite a few uh, science fiction films that are co-productions, the first two, Ginza Zakam's comes later. Um, but the co-productions are often East German, Polish, Czechoslovak co-productions. And all of them, what they do is that they try to imagine the nuclear disaster as something that has already taken place, both in the past and far away. Um, so Planeta Smrti, which is also known as First Spaceship on Venus, um, which has many different titles in many different languages, is a film in which scientists travel to Venus and they realize that Venus had a sophisticated civilization that completely undid itself through nuclear war. 
right? And so it's this imagination of what could have happened on Earth, but it's displaced onto Venus. Um, Barbara has already mentioned the Cari X Bay, in which it's nuclear warheads in a floating capitalist spaceship where everybody has killed themselves. Um, and the reason I put Kinzadza up here is Kinzadza is quite different. Kinzadza is not a co-production of the Soviet film from a much later period, but it highlights the fact to which in the Soviet Union it was so impossible to imagine anything being related to nuclear apocalypse. In Kinzadza, it's just it's a it's a planet that's devastated that doesn't have any water or nutrients, and so we first meet our protagonists on this kind of desiccated planet. Um, and there's another film, Ferasparad Astra, which also imagines like a dying planet that's devoid of resources. And it's unclear, kind of a Mad Max style environment, and it's unclear what's caused that environment. Um, but what's important is that in all of these, this is another planet in a faraway place and something that's already happened in the past. Then we get a series of, in the late socialist period, we get a few, I shouldn't even call it a series, just a few kind of films here and there, um, which are art films, which aspire to the status of art films. The first is, of course, Hotel Ozone, which Barbara described and analyzed so beautifully. Um, and then together with it in the volume, we have a chapter by Eliza Rose um, on Ciwe Miejsca, uh, which is a Polish film called Tender Spots from 1981. And I personally have included this Polish hit comedy that millions of people watched in Poland from 1984 called Sex Misja or Sex Mission. Um, and so that one's not an art film, it's a comedy. But what unites all of these films is that they're imagining a kind of post-apocalyptic landscape and again, the event itself is already in the past. It's already happened and we start after the event. And we start in a universe that is just kind of like slowly, kind of like slowly becoming more and more decrepit. Um, and so what interests me here is the fact that if you think about American analogs, right? In the American analogs, uh, the kind of the nuclear war is always an excuse on which to hang spectacular visuals, really stunning graphics. Um, and in the American films, we always get a lone survivor who perseveres against all odds and rallies everybody. Um, behind them. What we get in the Eastern European films is, instead is decrepit infrastructure. <laughs> and instead of a hero locating other survivors, what we get are doomed loners, just kind of suffering away their time on earth. Um, and the world goes out not so much with a bang as with a long whimper. What these films do allow us to track is that as the Cold War went on, the threat really shifts from the threat of nuclear war um, to increasingly the threat of an accident at one of the atomic power plants. Um, but the, but the result of all of this, the fact that you can kind of name these films on one hand or on two hands, means that there was a dearth, and a dearth of iconographic reference for anything like nuclear disaster before Chernobyl happened. And so that's my main argument here, is that when Chernobyl happens, there's kind of no tradition, no visual, audiovisual tradition uh, within which to conceptualize or understand it. Um, and this lack, I think, comes across most clearly in Svetlana Alexievich's tome of oral history, titled Voices from Chernobyl. And she interviewed many people for this project. One of the people that she interviews is a resettler named Anna Badayeva, so somebody who used to live in one of the villages near Chernobyl and had to be relocated after the disaster. And this resettler asks, what's it like radiation? Maybe they show it in the movies. Have you seen it? Is it white or what? Some people say that it has no color and no smell, and other people say that it's black like earth. But if it's colorless, then it's like God. God is everywhere, but you can't see him. So in 1986, actually, kind of contrary to everything we might imagine, there were two documentaries that were made by the Soviets immediately in the wake of the disaster. And these documentaries essentially set out to answer Badaeva's question, what does radiation look like? So although the party's first reflex was to impose an information blackout, it eventually reversed its policy when the Western press began uh, attacking the USSR for its silence. Fearful that the Soviet people might learn what had happened from foreign sources, Gorbachev eventually allowed newspapers to report on the disaster before delivering an address on television himself. And among the journalists who were allowed to travel to Chernobyl um, to cover the cleanup effort were two documentary teams. One was led by Alan Sergienka of the Central Studio for Documentary Film in Moscow, and the other by Vladimir Shevchenko of the Ukrainian Documentary and Newsreel Studio in Kiev. Both documentaries were heavily, heavily censored, um, and received only a limited release in the Soviet Union. But, and this is fascinating, they were sold to 127 countries worldwide. And Shevchenko's film actually toured American college campuses as part of the Glasnost Film Festival. Both films were also, I just want to acknowledge this, um, essentially suicide missions. Both teams traveled to Chernobyl fully aware that the endeavor might cost them their lives and spent approximately three months on site. Sergienka was miraculously unaffected. He lived to be 79 and made seven more documentaries about Chernobyl, but one of his cameramen, Ivan Dvonikov, 
succumbed to radiation sickness shortly after completing work on the film. And there's a really moving interview in which Sergienka says that Dvonikov actually covered him when they were watching the reactor. He put his body in between himself and Sergienka and kind of took the, the radiation. Um, Shevchenko in turn died 11 months um, after leaving the, the expulsion zone, completely embattled. Actually, he didn't know if the film would be shown, and battling censors and just very depressed. He kept a diary. Um, and so we have the diary kind of his time in the hospital um, and his thoughts and reflections on trying to get the film out. So collectively, the two documentaries represent the first attempts to find a way of speaking about and representing radiation. Um, and in the chapter that I wrote, I go into greater depth. Here, I'm just going to summarize the arguments really quickly. So essentially, and I, I'll, I'll completely judge here, um, for me, The Bell of Chernobyl is the more conventional film. Um, it opens with imagery of a cloud, recalling that already pioneered, I think, within a lot of kind of US media of the mushroom cloud. Um, it folk, oh, here, here's some more uh, images of Shevchenko uh, on set. I forgot, and here's a memorial to him in Kiev. Okay. So the Bell, of the Bell of Chernobyl is the film by Sergienka from the Moscow studio. So here's this image of the cloud, which opens and closes the film. I won't play the clip for the sake of time. Um, a lot of the film focuses on the peasants who have had to leave their land um, and their mourning uh, at, this, at having to leave it, as well as their uh, very honest descriptions of how they try to sneak back um, and to penetrate back into the zone. Uh, the film also features a lot of the iconography that would become the standard iconography for speaking about Chernobyl afterwards. I, I think this film kind of invents it. Um, it's a lot of Geiger counters taking an otherwise lush and verdant fields, villages with the windows and the doors barred, closed, um, and of course the Ferris wheel in Pripex, the biggest city that used to house almost all of the workers standing still. Um, so what this film does, the way in which it figures radiation is mostly as an absence and an abnegation and a renunciation, right? So radiation means renouncing all of this land, renouncing these areas. Um, it's an image of everything that has been abandoned. Um, and the, the problem is figured primarily through human absence um, in these shots. Um, and here's just some more images of these, you know, the barbed wire marking the, the limits of the zone. Uh, Chronicle of Difficult Weeks, Shevchenko's film, that's the Kiev based crew, to me personally is the much more interesting film because it's trying to figure out how to figure radiation, not negatively as an absence or renunciation, but positively. And the solution they come up with, and I, I can't play the clip, right, because we don't have sound. I can try. I'll, I'll describe the clip. Um, but basically what they realized is that when they submitted, so both teams actually faced this with editors. Editors were afraid to handle the reels of film because the reels of film themselves contained radiation. And in Moscow, the editors only wanted to handle like the second positive copy. Um, they were told, the, the Shevchenko's team, that one of the reels was problematic because it had all of these pockmarks and a lot of hissing noise. And so they were told not to use the film, but instead they actually ended up including it in the film. And basically this image that I would have shown you is images of the reactor where they say, they say that radiation doesn't have a face or a voice, but here it is, these pockmarks that you see in the film, that's the face of radiation. The hissing that you're constantly hearing on the background, that's the voice of radiation. And all of this is done with a direct address to the viewer. So Shevchenko's voice is there imploring the viewer to look closely and to listen. Um, and so what I argue in the piece is that these kinds of direct address to the viewer, that it, um, it invites the viewer to become more conscious of his or her sensorial apparatus to look and to listen actively. And it also encourages us to look at the film differently, um, to concentrate our attention, not on what is immediately apparent, the signal, um, but everything that we normally would ignore, the noise, um, the pockmarks on the image, the static on the soundtrack. And it's significant that Chernobyl occurred just before the transition to digital film, because this technique is only possible when you're dealing with analog film. And something actually that a few scholars have thought about is that digital cameras stop functioning in zones of high radiation. And so this fact that Chernobyl marks kind of it occurs as the Soviet Union kind of it anticipates the breakup of the Soviet Union triggers it in many ways, but it's also situated at this moment of transition from analog to digital um, and plays with that in really interesting ways. And so finally, the last kind of big argument that I make in there is that both films rely really heavily on voiceover to stitch this kind of tapestry of images and reflections together. Because both films were so heavily censored, they're very polyphonic. You can hear very different types of tone and voice in them, even though it's being read by one person. Um, and both of them can be seen as a form of the essay film or as a revival of the essay film form. And this is very surprising because the idea of the essay film is something that 
the French kind of come up with what the essay film is, but they quote Zygavirtov, they quote Eisenstein, they quote all of these Soviet film theorists as having conceived of the idea of a video essay before the, of a film essay before the film essay itself. But in the Soviet Union, it's not really used um, since the late 1920s. And so what Chernobyl triggers is a revival of the film essay form. Um, and I had this question of why, why turn to the film essay so late in the history of, of Soviet filmmaking? And I think the reason has to do with the fact that whenever people are faced with any kind of event of huge magnitude, to describe it directly, there's something obscene about it, right? You risk obscenity. Whereas the film essay, when you go at it obliquely and in fragments, um, somehow that seems to be the more correct approach. And these films in their tone, I'm not playing clips just for the lack of time, um, but you can see the connection to Night and Fog. You can see the connection to Hiroshima Mon Amour. Um, and so kind of the, the, the last argument that I'll end on is that Chernobyl can be said to instigate not only the literal fracturing and collapse of the former Soviet Union, um, but also of its monumentalism, of its coherent and cohesive way of knowing, right? And so in the end, we can't really know anything fully. We can't know things directly. We can only come at things obliquely and in fragments. Thank you. So thank you so much to all three of our speakers today. Um, I want to invite everybody online, everybody here to get your questions ready. Uh, does anybody have a question right now? We're a small but mighty crew. <laughs> I'm happy to, to get us started. Um, and I was, I was especially taken, Masha, with uh, your comments about the environmental conditions of film production in Chernobyl uh, mm -hmm. and their devastating consequences for the crews who were involved which got me thinking about all of our presenters today. And so I'm wondering if if all of you could speak a little bit about the environmental conditions of producing these films. I imagine they were quite different, but also not entirely unrelated. Do you wanna go first? Barbara has a fascinating section on this in her chapter for the book about the dressage. Um, yeah, dressage was also a part of the um, experience for the women uh, who were chosen for the film, uh, they were uh, non-actors who were chosen based on a um, series of sessions. Uh, there were 300 candidates uh, chosen for their physical appearance and their ability to over surmount an obstacle course in the Czechoslovak Army Film Studio. So, so they had to uh, jump over fire pit, wa wade through water, and jump on horses. And there was this uh, quite troubling term that um, Jan Schmidt used uh, when referring to this form of training because he used uh, the term dressage, which uh, is a particularly regular, rigorous form of training horses. And uh, that also points to the quite troubled gender dynamics of, of the film production. Um, and I think that also more broadly speaking, and that's something that I think also relates to um, the talks by Masha and Katie that that's, uh, refer to the sort of environmental, uh, the spaces, the uh, abandoned urban spaces, uh, uh, the sort of um, erasures of local memory and history and uh, modes of displacement of people. So actually uh, the uh, crumbling buildings and eerily empty uh, urban spaces were shot in the northwestern border region of the of Dopov, which uh, was a town uh, that was um, from which the German population has been expelled in the uh, aftermath of World War II. Um, and so there is this like a real historic and political charge to that as well. And then this uh, town was abandoned in. 1954 to kind of uh, give space to the largest Czechoslovak military training zone. And that's how the crew actually got involved. So um, because they were the only ones permitted to shoot in that uh, type in those inaccessible areas. And so it's striking that they also kind of contribute to um, in a different way that what uh, the, the project that uh, Katie mentioned in the context of preserving the memory of um, those villages, but there is also this incredibly beautiful dilapidated Baroque structure, that town square, and all of these kinds of 
uh, memories of all, all the people who lived there that are striking. And then the, the other parts of the film were actually created in the uh, Shumava border region, uh, which is on the southwest of Bohemia. And uh, these landscapes were highly militarized. And so they were able to kind of capture the environmental contradictions at play in those uh, places because they were both the subject of uh, devastation and contamination, of course, by military activity. Uh, and we, we can see that in the film uh, when the women discover that barrel of, of gasoline that's actually found in an underground bunker uh, and the ammunition uh, perhaps as well. And then, uh, but at the same time, it's kind of um, this uh, space where the absence of uh, regular human activity and practices such as agriculture and mining is absent. So the, the vegetation can also thrive in other ways and it would, the sort of overgrown lush um, uh, greenery that, that emerges throughout the, the film is really like a big um, marker of that. I'll, I'll maybe just, this isn't an answer to Molly's question, but uh, your answer, Barbara, made me realize that all three of our papers are considering films shot in zones, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Hotel Ozone was shot in a, in a military zone that regular people didn't have access to. And then what Katie was describing were also kind of specialized zones. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this idea of, yeah, kind of like films being the only way by which we can have access to those, they're not places that you can go on your own. And so the film becomes an intermediary or a representative of an area that's inaccessible otherwise. Um, that all three of our papers deal with the loss of villages or the life, the loss of traditional kind of agrarian life. Um, and then something else that comes out in the volume, um, and not so much maybe in our talks, uh, is the fact that envir environments in and of themselves, but also environmental disasters know no boundaries, right? So like boundaries tend to be human drawn, um, but actually Katie and Alice Lovejoy wrote together a chapter for the volume that considers Vismut um, and also some kind of other like local mining activity that happens across the East German Czechoslovak border. Um, and so I think films as embodied experiences that take us to zones we wouldn't be able to access um, also are able to question borders in a really interesting way. And maybe, I don't know, Katie, if you want to respond to Molly's yeah, question. I, was, I had two different things I wanted to say. First of all, I, Masha's um, example of the Chernobyl people with their radioactive film, that's amazing. Um, I mean, that's also shows enormous civil courage and the the burning need to document it at whatever price. Um, I, I guess I would say of my people, in a way, the um, the Vismut film to me is especially moving because actually in a in a deep way, it's a socialist film that is that is finding a mode of solidarity among the the surviving miners that's amazing. They have this amazing rapport. The film also indexes older miners culture and songs from miners culture where they're, they're wishing each other luck and getting back out of the ground again. So in a way, the film is gesturing towards the roots of the 19th century roots of socialism in industrialization and, and you know, these, these very, um, high mortality extractive technologies that are there. Um, but it's full of anger at the failure of the state to protect its people. So I think the thing is at this point to go into Vismut for a day to shoot, right, it's, it's dangerous and it's dirty. Um, and the mine is still being remediated. Um, the people who made the Vismut Villages one continue to make documentaries about um, uranium remediation around the world. They also made a documentary about the RLC. So they're interested in the kind of post-Soviet cleanup situations. But the real point is the this large population of half a million to a million people lived and worked there over years. And somehow the thought of their survival and safety was leased on the minds of the the, the builders of socialism. And you know they were they were being implicitly asked to make a sacrifice with their lives and their health to these uncertain ends and basically to foster a kind of war machine that terrified them and everybody else um one other thing i wanted to say and this isn't this wasn't exactly molly's molly's question but it's maybe related to it one reason i highlighted the kind of meta medial elements in many of the pictures i showed like note photocopier, note video technology, note camera, note photo, 
is, of course, this is also a period of media transition. So one of the reasons in, in Czechoslovakia, there was a, Alice Lovejoy writes about this, there was a, um, there was a video media newsletter, which was um, made by kind of underground people and smuggled out of Czechoslovakia and on video cassettes and shown on a worldwide circuit. So there were ways in which emerging reproductive technology was kind of challenging the state monopoly on media, which at least in East Germany was very crucial. Okay, we've let you guys have the Xerox machine for your church purposes. You're not supposed to be allowing traitorous materials about eco-crisis in our country be printed on them or be mimic mimeographed on them. You know, and this is actually in East Germany, one of the main reasons why a lot of the opposition groups clustered around the churches. They were liberal spaces. They were open to various forms of civic conversation and they also had means of reproduction that no no one normally had access to a xerox machine um so anyway i mean i guess i just wonder you know we have a coming together of this massive eco disaster and this potential shift in media control and both of those things were actually crucial for the end of that dispensation and the the opening of a different dispensation, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, do we have other questions? I actually have two. Uh, one, I will, first of all, thank you so much for all of your talk. Um, it was amazing. So my first question is to Katie and it's rather small one. I was really fascinated by the, the quote um, that you had that the people who live there already know and no one else, uh, and people who do not live here, they, um, like, yeah, they don't, yeah, no one else needs to know. And I was wondering, um, so uh, this is coming from an official source, if, um, if there are any other um, similar quotes and or like official response um, that is as cynical as this one. So that would be my first question. And the second question is more broad and it goes to all three of you, um, uh, because the volume I think covers both documentary and fiction. So I wonder uh, what's your take on the dynamic between the documentary imagery of the Muslim disaster and the fictional imagery. I mean, there's definitely some dialogue uh, in terms of iconography. Um, do they follow kind of the same lines? Do they contribute each other? So I think it's just more like that. Thank you. Katie, mm -hmm. hey, do you want to respond to the first question? Take um, the time to think about yes, the second. I, I, I had a bit of trouble hearing it. Uh, but yes, there are certainly other quotes um, about the same film. The agricultural minister said, this will never, ever be shown in our cinemas. So, I mean, this is always uh, the way of it. Um, you know, there's a, there's a deep unwillingness on the part of the censors to actually admit that anything is wrong, but it's evidently wrong. I mean, the, the, the forests were dying and that was clear to anybody who walked in them. Um, yeah, as, as, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, there's, there's all kinds of, um, and of course, after 89, a lot of the new work was, especially in the 90s and 2000s, a lot of the new work was about censored films and what all had been said, um, re reconstituting the paperwork, what what have the official opinions been? So there's actually a thick file on, and you know, occasionally um, oppositional films would be used as Stasi training films. This is what we're looking for. So there's a complicated interplay. I'm 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 sorry that that might or might not answer your question, but Do you want me to go? Okay. That's that's a really fascinating question about documentary versus fiction. And it was something we, we made a conscious choice to, to think across that divide. Um, I think that a lot of what you find is what you would expect, right? That the documentary films are more focused on critique and trying to use the the, the status of the image as more as evidence. Um, whereas in the fiction films, it's a lot more about a kind of sensorial aesthetic exploration. Um, I think that's something that's particularly fascinating. So one thing that I'll say about not necessarily nuclear films, um, in my dis in my dissertation, hopefully my book, I have a chapter about Polish ecological documentary of the 1970s. And what you see a lot of is um, nationalist movements and ecological movements going hand in hand. 
because um, the industrialization of Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary is perceived as a Soviet imposition, um, there's a kind of there's a way in which ecological movements converge with nationalist movements. Um, and so a lot of what happens is that in these images, the voiceover becomes incredibly important because the voiceover tells you how to see and how to perceive the images. And I'm always paying a lot of attention to what's happening with sound in the documentaries and how they're drawing your attention to certain elements and not others. Um, with the fiction, I'm just kind of freewheeling here, but something Barbara said earlier um, really resonated with me, which is that in a lot of the fiction films, there, there's almost like a similar aesthetic that you get in Stalker and Hotel Ozone and a lot of these films. There's an emphasis on decrepit structures, decrepit infrastructure, and also images of nature that we know is polluted and yet is still strangely verdant or still strangely like luscious, right? And I think that the fiction films are much more interested in exploring aesthetic divisions between like things that we know are bad and yet are still beautiful, right? And like how how, how can the mind combine those things? And so I think they're engaging with aesthetic aesthetic and moral categories or thinking about how those come together in the image. Um, that would be like my first just kind of impromptu attempt at an answer. Can I bring really, up, oh, oh, sorry. Could, could I bring up one other thing? In East Germany, at least, there was, the documentarians got more and more discouraged in the 80s partly because in the 60s and 70s, they were occasionally able to make films that were pretty critical and that, that didn't just drown out what people were saying about their workplaces with voiceover, but they actually you know, expressed some kind of critique or, or expressed indifference to the official ideals and the films were able to capture that. And so the documentarians felt they had a kind of bond with the, people they were filming and they were kind of spokesmen for the people they were filming. By the eighties, this had become much more difficult because the government was really anxious and wary and would kind of shut that all down. And so they, so some documentarians, especially people working in industrial workplaces, you know, which were very polluted, which had all kinds of labor problems, they would come in and people were suspicious and didn't want to talk to them. They saw them as kind of state agents. And I think, that was very wounding to the kind of amour propre of these documentarians who were trying their best, but the system, you know, the, the lines kind of hardened and they were actually pretty unable to convey what they actually saw and taped because it would just be censored out. So that's a factor as well. Sorry to interrupt you, Barbara. No worries, that's really, um... Fascinating to think about the difference between what, what are the possibilities and limits of both of these documentary and fiction forms. And what's um, actually striking, um, I found personally, that that Schmidt and Juracek actually worked as part of a uh, army film studio that produced mostly, so they worked specifically on documentaries, newsreels, reportages. And so they were actually part of that a whole system that was creating instructional films and military propaganda. And it's really, and this is actually something that Alice Lovejoy in her uh, in-depth kind of study of uh, Czechoslovak army film has also revealed is that it was not only this uh, kind of more standard military uh, film studio that would produce uh, documentaries for uh, the purposes of the army, but that actually it was also a training ground for a, uh, an entire generation of young filmmakers that would become some of the most crucial figures of the Czechoslovak new wave. So not just uh, Schmidt and Juracek, but also Jan Niemetz, Jiri Menzel, and others. So that was really fascinating. And uh, the Army Film Studio um, led this production of two um, fiction films. And uh, what made me uh, think about uh, Masha's point about the fact what, you know, of the sort of uh, effective sensorial and aesthetic exploration. So uh, what um, might be the critical thing that fiction film can bring that documentaries can't led me to uh, consider the other films that I mentioned in my talk, each of them include at least, you know, some um, actual documentary footage. So there is this kind of hybrid format that they introduce. However, Hotel Ozone absolutely refuses to do so. And um, I found this uh, really fascinating um, statement by Schmidt who actually, uh, perhaps it might speak to that issue. Uh, and he, he says, we are all too used to the usual propaganda proclaiming the danger of those terrible nuclear weapons. It's indifference and indifference must be feared. I attempted to make this film against posters. People are used to reacting to posters and newspapers like masses. 
in general terms and without feelings, while in my film, I try to affect each viewer individually so that everyone would feel in their own way. So I think that's actually um, quite a powerful uh, comment on that note. Yeah. I have one last thought on this, which is uh, something that I want to explore more that I don't know enough about. We have a, a colleague, Reza Sidyanova, who I think knows a lot more, um, but I can, I'm really curious about the, like, the legacy of Soviet poetic documentary and like what ends up happening with that in the late socialist period. Um, because I think that's a really interesting and ambivalent place to look at how documentary is being used. Um, and I, I'm also really curious about its afterlives as maybe something in between the kind of evidentiary documentary for critique and fiction film for sensory exploration kind of modalities. I think we may have come up against our time limit in this room. Um, and having been in this room before when another group is clamoring to come in, I know it's not pleasant. So I'm going to call an end to our event, um, but not before thanking our panelists one more time for really um, fantastic comments. Thank you so much. Please join me. And once again, if you are in person, come and join us. We'll raise a toast. We can talk more disaster films um, or whatever else you would like to talk about. Uh, and in general, celebrate the end of this academic year. That reception will be upstairs. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>